Thank you everyone for joining us for our third and final intermediate session for our training using you in Biodiversity Lab to monitor the pulse of the planet. My name is Amber McCollum and myself and Juan Torres Perez will be your RSET trainers throughout the series. And um, we are also here with many other guest speakers from the United Nations Development Program and others from the UN Biodiversity Lab team. Um, today, we will have Annie Vernig, Lauren Weatherden, and Dee Zhang with us. And we're really honored to have all of our partners here today and throughout the training series over these past few weeks. For this training, we will have two types of sessions. Our intermediate sessions, which are um, held here on GoToWebinar platform, and you've used the same registration link to join each week. These sessions consist of lectures and case study examples. The 1.5 hour intermediate sessions um, were held on the 14th of April, the 21st, and then today, the final session on the 28th. Note that for the intermediate sessions, we will present the same material each day in English, Spanish, and French. So please sign up for your language of choice. There are also two advanced labs, which will be held on April 27th, and May 4th. They are hosted by the UNBL team via Zoom with separate registrations. They are given in English with simultaneous interpretations in French and Spanish. Unfortunately, the registrations for these labs are already closed, but you can check back on our course website for information about those um, training sessions after the series is over. All of the course materials can be found here on the RSET training website. So this includes the recordings of the sessions um, via links to our YouTube channel, the presentation materials, and, the, and now the Google Form homework that's available for the intermediate sessions. So I encourage you all to also type in your questions to the Q&A box along the way and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the session today. And we will post all of the questions and answers on our website for reference um, after we've completed them. And if we don't get to your question during the session, you can also email myself or my colleague Juan or Annie at our email addresses shown here. For all three of the inter intermediate sessions, we have this one follow on um, homework that is now available on the course website. To receive credit for this homework, you must submit all answers via Google Forms by the deadline of Thursday, May 12th. To receive a certificate of completion, you must attend all three live webinars and complete the homework. And it can take some time to process so many certificates, so please be patient with us and expect to receive those about two months after the completion of the course. The UNBL team will also be issuing certificates of completion for their advanced labs. Each of these labs will require an assignment to be submitted to the UNBL team and more details on the submission process and the certificates will be provided during those sessions. So here's the general overview of our intermediate sessions. We've already covered um, how to use UN Biodiversity Lab to support country-led action. And last week, we talked about exploring the UN Biodiversity Public Platform. And then this week in our final session, um, we're going to be discussing how to explore the um, secure workspaces. For the advanced labs, as I mentioned, each had their own registration. Um, Advanced Lab 1 um, talked about mastering the UMBL public platform and provided that really in-depth deep dive. And then Advanced Lab 2 will be focusing on that deep dive of the secure workspaces. Each of these labs will have um, hands-on exercises to guide you through these functionalities as well. So this week, we will begin with a recap of what we learned during our last session. Then we will review UNBL workspace functionalities. Then we will discuss essential life support areas and other forthcoming functionalities. 
We will then have time at the end for our question and answer session. So now I'd like to hand it over to Annie Vernig, who will pro be providing a recap from last session. So over to you, Annie. Great, thank you, Amber, and good morning, good afternoon, and good evening once more to all of our participants. It's a pleasure to be back with all of you again. So before we dive into our detailed training today, I just wanna provide a little recap of our session last week, where we provided you with training on the UN Biodiversity Lab public platform. So we began with an exploration of data available on UNBL, from protected areas data, to data on biodiversity, to data on carbon and climate change, to data on human well-being, including water security. I'm not going to go through all of these today, but you can access our full data list using the QR code on this screen, and you can also access Oscar's full presentation from last week on the NASA RSET webpage. We then explored our UN Biodiversity Lab data collections. Our UNBL collections aim to bring together data layers for insight and for action. We currently have two collections on protected areas and on nature-based solutions for climate change, which are seen on this screen. Finally, we explored how all functions of the public platform work and how you can access and use them. You can see the areas that we covered together on this slide. And again, you can access this full presentation on the NASA RSET webpage. And that's it. Today we'll build on the topics we covered last week to introduce you to our UNBL workspaces. With that, I will turn it back over to my colleague, Dee, who will dive in to provide you all with a detailed training on our workspaces. Dee, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Dee John. I'm a spatial planning analyst with UNDP. It is such a pleasure to be here with all of you today, and thank you so much for joining us. In the training last week, we explored all the functionalities available to users on the UN Biodiversity Lab public platform. Today, we will dive deep into our another important and powerful tool, the UNBL Secure Workspaces. We have designed today's training to cover the main elements of our UNBL workspaces from an overview of the functionalities to the core operational skills. Here in my presentation, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to send them through the chat or email us. We'll make sure all your questions will be answered. All right, now let's get started. Let's begin with the very basic question, what is an UNBL workspace? Besides the hundreds of global data sets available on our public platform, we also recognize that governments and local stakeholders often have much better data for their countries or regions than what's available at the global level. And they often need to bring together multiple departments and other key users to collaborate across silos. And that's how we come up with the idea of secure workspaces. Our workspaces enable any non-commercial users from governments to indigenous people organizations to collaborate on an UN hosted server where they can share and manage their spatial data in a secure working environment. With the workspaces, you can grant access to a discrete set of users, upload your own data layers, upload your own areas of interest and calculate our global indices within your own places. Now that we have a general idea of what the workspaces are, how do you create one for your needs? For those who might be interested, the very next step is to submit an application form to us. 
on our homepage, scroll down and you will find an option called create a UNBL workspace. Click on learn more to enter the workspace page. There you will find an overview of the workspaces similar to what I just presented. And then scroll down, you will find a form to request a workspace. All you need to do there is to fill in the information required, including your contact, your organization, and how you plan to use the workspace. I want to say this here that it is only available for registered users, so please make sure that you have created an account with UNBL before you send out your application. And then once you have filled in all the information, you can click on submit your request. When we receive your request, we will review your application and respond to you shortly. For those who, uh, for those of you who are participating in our second advanced lab next week, we have created temporary workspaces for you and we'll be sharing this information shortly. Let's turn to uh, how approved users can engage with the workspace. Once you have been granted membership to a UNBL workspace, accessing it is very simple. First, make sure you're logged in to UNBL University Lab. And second, click on the map view. You should see on my screen, the first one named UNBL is our public platform. And under these are all the workspaces you're a member of. Um, this is my screen, so I've joined many workspaces. My list, my list might be much longer than yours. And next, to view the data in your workspace, you should click the checkbox to activate this workspace. Same with the public platform. First, click on the places to view all the place shape files you uploaded and then click on layers to view the layers you uploaded. For example, now I am viewing the national and regional data in my workspace. Um, but of course, if you uploaded nothing, you will find nothing there. We also highly recommend that you view your workspace data together with the global data on UNBL. And how do you do this? Again, click on the map view and activate the top one named the UNBL. As said, this is our public platform with all the global data layers. Once I have activated the public platform, you can see that the global dynamic metrics have now popped up. And these indices will be automatically calculated for your places of interest. For me, uh, what I'm demonstrating here is the rectangle, which um, demarcates the bond box of Serengeti. And now on my screen, there are both data from the public platform and data in my workspace. This very useful function allows me to visualize layers from my own project with any of the global layers available for UNBL. For example, here I am visualizing the essential life support areas in Uganda, which is the layer from my own workspace. And now I'm overlapping it with the global intact forest layer from UNBL. In that way, I can view how much of the intact forest is covered by my project area. And now you might start to ask, with this useful function, how do I upload my own data like what you did there? The answer is through your workspace admin page. So next, let's go through the workspace administration step by step. To access the admin page of your workspace, Again, click on the map view menu, and there you will see an admin button at the right of the name of your workspace. Click on this admin button of the workspace you want to enter, and then the browser will jump to the admin page of your workspace. For example, I am accessing my um, workspace named UNBL ELSA, that I'm an owner of. Now we have access to the admin page of the workspace. Let's navigate the various components. 
First, click on the tab to the right of the Home button to extend the drop-down menu. There, you will find the components you can manage, including places, layers, and users. You might also see widgets and dashboards there. Currently, those two functions are not customizable for regular users, but they will come soon. Select the components you would like to view, and we will now go through each of them in the following slides. We'll start simple from managing the users. Once you have created your workspace, you have the ability to share it with other users to create a community of practice. We currently offer four types of rules, enabling you to grant your collaborators the most appropriate degree of access to your workspace. Let's start with the lowest level of access, viewers. Users granted viewer privileges can view any data or places you published from your workspace, but they won't have any admin options. And then editors have increased access. They can additionally upload or delete data within the workspace. And for the admins, they have um, another additional ability to manage the users, including add new users, assign them roles, and remove users that no longer belong this project. Finally, the superpower goes to the owners. The owners hold all the controls over the workspace. They can change the name or even delete the whole workspace, and of course, manage the users as well as all the data layers. So as said, to add new users to a workspace, you need to be at least an admin or an owner. Then, follow these steps. First things first, the new users you want to add must already have a registered UNBL account. Otherwise, you will fill your mission because the workspaces are available for registered users only. And once your users have registered on UNBL, to add them, look at the left-hand side of my screen, click on the drop-down menu, and navigate to the users page. And then, enter the user's email address um, and assign them the appropriate roles. I am demonstrating this workspace as the owner, so I am available to grant my users the other three types of roles, admin, editor, and viewer. Um, and if I am only an admin, I, what I can grant is the editor and the viewer's roles. Okay, once all set, click on add users. If you succeed, there will be a notice in green that says your users have been invited. And you will also find this email in the users list below. Now, uh, what happens if I try to add a user who haven't registered on the NBL at all? What I will get is um, an error message that says this email account is not available. Um, and then if you change your mind and want to give the user a different role, you can simply scroll to the email address of the users, click on the drop-down menu at the right of the email, then select the role you want to change to. There is also another option to remove this user from your workspace. And next, let's turn to adding spatial data to your workspace. We will talk about two different types of data, places and layers. This part might be a little bit challenging if you have no GIS background at all, but don't worry, I will show you step by step. Now, simply review what we just learned. To add data, you must be an owner, admin, or editor of this workspace. Now let's look at the two types of geospatial data that you can add. The first one is places or areas of interest. Places will always be a vector data, such as a polygon boundary of a country or a protected area, polygon, and so on. And then the second option is data layers. These can be either raster or vector data. You can see some layers examples listed on my slide. Um, and first, I'm going to show you how to add new places or areas of interest to your workspace. 
This functionality allows you to upload a vector shape file for a subnational, national, or transboundary area of interest. Once this area file is uploaded to your workspace, you can use all the functionalities on the public platform for it, including calculation of dynamic metrics, clipping and exploiting raster data layers to the range of your place. And our security guarantees that only users of your workspace will be able to access and use this chip file. So how do we do this? To add a new place to your workspace, navigate to the place page from the pull down menu on the left hand side of the admin tool. Click on create new place button. Um, next, I will use the national boundary of Costa Rica as an example to demonstrate all the steps. So on the new place page, fill in all the following information. First title, insert your place name. We recommend you to keep this short and clear. And then for place type, select the appropriate class from the drop-down menu. In my case, it's a country. And then the slug. The slug is a unique identifier for the place. And that contains only lowercase letters, numbers, and heap hints. No space can be used. There, we recommend you to use the Generate a Slug Name button to let the system help you generate a proper slug. And there, we're at the Upload Your Place button. Currently, we only accept GeoJSON file format, and each of the single file has to be under six megabytes. If you have um, a GIS software like QGIS, it's easy to convert the file format, and I will show you how to do this in my next slide. Then um, after you have chosen your file, uh, uploaded it, click on the Save and View Details part button, um, and then if you're able to preview your place in the map box, like my screen here, it means you have uploaded this place file successfully. Now, in case you need more guidance on converting the file format, the easiest way I found is to convert it directly with GIS software. QGIS or OCGIS can all do that. For example, in QGIS, first load your shape file and then click on export and select the save features as. There you will be able to find a list of the file format, select the GeoJSON one. Then don't forget to check your coordinate reference system, the CRS. Make sure it's in uh, EPFG 4326. After all set, click on export. There you will get a GeoJSON file. Beyond this, I'd like to also remind you that each place file needs to be a single feature vector file. It is okay to have multiple polygons in one file, like uh, my file here but they all need to be merged as one feature. All right, back to the workspace. Once you have saved your new place, you will be brought to the location's home screen. For your place to be accessible in the map view, you must publish the place by clicking on the publish the to go on the top right corner of my screen. For example, currently without publishing, I can't find this place on the map view. And when I go back to administration page and click publish place, also click to feature it in the left panel, the Costa Rica has popped up on my place panel. If I click on it, the map will zoom it in automatically. And with that, now you're able to view the global data set or clip and export the data to the range of your area of interest. When you activate the public platform, the dynamic metrics will also automatically calculate it for your place. And this function is very powerful, especially when your place of interest are not available on the public platform, like uh, local scale areas or uh, local communities. Great, so now um, you know how to upload places. What about the data layers? Layers are your second data upload option, and this enables you to add your own spatial data to the workspace and view them together with other global data available on UNBL. 
we have built multiple API connectors for you to link your existing data from various cloud-based data repositories. For example, for raster layers, we support the Google Earth Engine, GE, um, and Microsoft Planner Computer. For raster layers, you can use Cardo, and the Earth Story Connector will be available soon. Besides that, you can also upload your data to the UNBL data repository on Azure, Azure and add them to your workspace. Again, our security guarantees that only users of your workspace will be able to access and use any data layers you uploaded. Um, next, I'm going to show you an example of pulling raster data from the Google Earth Engine. To add a new data layer, first navigate to the Layers page from the pull-down menu on the left-hand side and select the Create a New Layer button. Now on the New Layers page, same with Places, you need to fill in the following information. And here I'm going to use a layer of Global Human Footprint Index as an example. So for the layer name, it's Human Footprint 2013. And the slug is a unique identifier of the layer. We recommend you to generate a slug name. And so the system will pick appropriate slug for you. Then the included layers, uh, it is for the group the layers only, not for the single layers. We'll cover it later, uh, but for now we can skip it. Next, the layer provider. Choose the source you are deriving this layer from. My data is from the Google Earth Engine, so I choose GE here. And please make sure you select the correct option. And if you want to uh, want your layer to be downloadable for other users, you can activate the toggle bar of enable your layer download. Next, the layer type. Um, choose the correct type of your data. My is a raster here. And then the layer category, select the appropriate thematic class from the drop down menu. For my data, it's about the human pressure on nature, so I choose human impact and pressure. Last but not least, for layer descriptions, it is the introduction of this layer. And whatever you put here will show up on the layer information page on the legend bar. So um, you can put in the information of layer descriptions, like um, the layer citations in the um, description box. All right, after all set, the next part is the layer config. This is kind of the most important part to bring this layer to UNBL successfully. And I would like to spend more time here to talk through how you're going to edit those configs. As you can see on my slide, the config follows a particular template that can be copied and pasted into additional new layers. You can find this information on our workspace user guide. I'd like to ask my colleague to drop the link to the chat. And to start, let me point out the part of the config you need to edit by yourself. First, highlighted in pink is the asset ID of your data in GE. It has to match exactly the data you're uploading. For example, this is my data in my GE asset, and I need to copy the image ID here and paste it to the config. It has to be exactly the same, otherwise the layer can't be pulled successfully. Next, set the color of your map and design the style of the legend. For continuous data, we suggest you to use the ramp tab. For categorical data, we suggest you to use interval. The human footprint layer I am pulling is a continuous data, so I select ramp here. And then highlighted in yellow is the color I set based on the value of my data. The human footprint value range from 0 to 50, and I want to give different colors to different value range. Here we are using the hex, the hex code for different color. It is very easy to find the color picker online by searching for hex color picker in your browser. And when you decided a color, just copy and paste the code here. 
And it's same with the legend styling. You can fill in the information here based on the color you set it above. For continuous type of data, we suggest you to use the gradients as the legend type, like highlighted on my screen currently. Um, and okay, now let's um, copy and paste this config to my layer page. Once you have all the info ready, you can click save and view details. And let's see what will happen next. After you click Save and View Details, UNBL will generate a layer page. Keep in mind that all the information you just filled in is still editable in the admin page. And we're not done here though. Next, make sure you did this. Now the layer is generated and a unique layer ID has been assigned. You must copy this ID and edit your config again to replace the template ID in your tile URL here. Now, if you um, replace it with the correct layer ID, click on Save again. Now your layer should be ready. If you want to activate this layer to the map view, make sure you click on the toggle bar on the top right corner of my screen to publish this layer and set it as primary. And then you're able to find this layer in the workspace. When you click on the toggle bar, we can activate to the map view and see if it works well. If the color is not what you're expecting, you can always go back to the admin page to change the config and change the color or the legend. Above is the demonstration of uploading new data layers to your workspace. Um, I guess the config might be the most challenging part for some of you, at least for me. So here I listed a summary of the config that you need to edit by yourself. First is your GE asset ID. Make sure it matches the data you're uploading. And then for layer styling, use RAM for continuous data and use interval for categorical data. Make sure you set the color and the, uh, based on your value range of the data. And then for the legend, same with the continuous data, we recommend you to use gradient type. And then for categorical data, you can use the basic type of legend. And in the end, make sure you have updated the layer ID with the correct one in the tiles URL. All right, so here comes the last but not least, a very useful function, how to make group layers. When you have multiple years data or multiple categorical data within the same data set, you can always group them together to further organize your layers list. For example, on the public platform, when you click on the nighttime light data set, in the drop down menu, there are different years of layers to view. Same with the ESA land cover. So, next, I'm going to show you how to make group layers in your workspace. Let's uh, first navigate to the layers page. Before group your layers together, you need to make sure you have uploaded all the single layers one by one following the steps I shared earlier. Here I am using the Human Footprint Index data set as an example, and you can see I already uploaded the layers for the year 2000, 2005, and 2015. And I will now group the three layers together. First, check, the, check each layer and see the top right corner of my screen. Make sure you have activate the publish the toggle bar but at the same time, do not mark them as primary. This part could be a little bit tricky. And then second, select the create new layer. Same with uploading new layer, fill in all the information required. For my example, it's uh, the human footprint index. And then I click on generate a slug name to generate a proper slug. Next, 
for the included layers, you need to select all the layers you want to group together. In my case, it's Human Footprint 2000, 2005, and 2013. Next, the layer provider is still uh, Google Earth Engine, GE, and the layer type. This one, select the group layer as your layer type. And then for the layer category, it's the same, human impacts and pressures. And then um, this comes to the layer conflict, the key of successfully creating group layers. But this part is very simple. All you need to do is to copy the config we provided in the workspace guidance doc and paste it here. So um, there's no need to edit anything. It's just to paste the config that we already written for you. And then click on save and view details. Now, this time, remember to publish the layer as well as mark it as primary. So this group layer can be added to your map view. Now let's return to the map view. And I can see my group layer popped up in my layers list. When I activate it, the multiple years layer are grouped in the drop-down menu and I can select any single layer I want to view. Okay, so now we've gone through the main functionalities of the workspaces as well as how to use them. I really hope I made myself clear and thank you so much for joining me today. As I mentioned a couple of times earlier, the conflicts can be found in our detailed workspace guidance document. So I'm sharing the links here. This document also provides the written version of all the information I have shared today. And it's available in five languages. Um, so I hope you find it useful. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. And if you registered the second advanced live session, me and my colleagues will be there and we'll get you through a couple hand-on exercises to make sure you know how to use the workspace function. With that, thank you so much for staying with me and I will hand it back to our facilitator. Great, thank you so much, Dee, and thank you for this comprehensive introduction to our UN Biodiversity Lab workspaces. To conclude this final session of our intermediate training, I'm thrilled to be back, this time with my colleague Lauren Weatherden from UNEP WCMC. Together, we'll zoom back out to look at the bigger picture. We'll touch on our vision moving forward at this critical juncture in time and explore how we think spatial, gen spatial data in general, and UN Biodiversity Lab in particular, can support informed, efficient action for nature, climate, and sustainable development. We'll also share about upcoming functionalities under development for UN Biodiversity Lab that you can expect to see in the coming year. All right, let's start with the vision. So as we confront the threats of biodiversity loss and climate change, we believe that spatial data is essential to help us take action. With over 2,000 satellites revolving around the Earth, the data they produce can serve as an integrator for planning, action, and monitoring across sectors. As we discussed way back in our first session, the current draft of the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework of the Convention on Biological Diversity recognizes the importance of spatial data and spatial planning to combat our biodiversity crisis. This is one of many global policy agreements and targets for which spatial data will be imperative. So how can we ensure that countries have the resources to access and use spatial data to deliver on these critical global targets? How can we ensure that countries have a way to use spatial data to precisely locate, locate where protecting, managing, and restoring nature could have the greatest impact? 
UNDP is coming together with our partners to support a vision of a world where government agencies develop spatial plans to achieve multiple goals that include conserving nature, sustaining ecosystem services, and mitigating our climate crisis. With UN Biodiversity Lab as our foundation, we're looking to enroll a comprehensive package of support for countries to use integrated spatial planning to make decisions, take action, and monitor the state of their biodiversity and ecosystem services. Today, Lauren and I will highlight the work of two initiatives that we see as critical for this vision, Nature Map and our work to map essential life support areas. We'll also show you how we're working to make both of these available through UNBL. And finally, we'll give you a sneak peek of the new things that you can expect from UNBL over the year to come. So let me turn it over to Lauren to talk a little bit about Nature Map. Lauren, over to you. Thank you very much, Annie. First, let's start with Nature Map. Our colleagues at NatureMap are using the science of systematic conservation planning to help us identify priority areas at the global level where action can achieve multiple goals effectively. Over the past several years, the NatureMap initiative has produced new global spatial data on the distribution of species, carbon stocks, and clean water provision by terrestrial ecosystems. And to do this, they developed global conservation and restoration analyses to highlight areas simultaneously valuable for species, for carbon stocks, and for clean water provision, using the science of systematic conservation planning. All of the results produced by the Nature Map Initiative are available through UN Biodiversity Lab. These types of global analyses are, and data are often useful for assessing the size of the prize from integrated planning, for informing global target setting under international conventions, for understanding the geographical distribution of potential priorities worldwide, as well as for making comparisons across international borders. At the same time, country ownership, data, and participative processes are essential for real-world planning that feeds into national strategies and action plans. For example, nature map approaches have been deployed at a national scale in Latin America, exploring how conservation actions in Argentina could deliver biodiversity conservation, clean water, and conservation of vulnerable carbon stocks. Spatial analyses that optimize across multiple objectives can suggest efficient solutions that maximize the benefits for a given area target. For restoration, for instance, Nature Map focused on the potential benefits of returning converted lands worldwide to a more natural state. They compared the outcomes of choosing areas on the basis of four scenarios, carbon sequestration alone, biodiversity conservation alone, the minimum cost alone, or a compromise scenario that accommodated all four. The analysis found that at the extremes, restoring 5% of converted lands chosen to maximize biodiversity benefits could reduce expected species extinctions by 43%, while selecting on the basis of cost alone would reduce extinctions by only 4%. The take home message is that area-based conservation plans can be designed to maximize results across multiple dimensions. And just to emphasize that spatial analysis is an input to a participative planning process not the solution all by itself. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Annie. Great, thanks, Lauren. At UNDP, we're pioneering a process that uses similar systematic conservation planning approaches to jointly prioritize for conservation, restoration, and sustainable land management. We work with country partners to map essential life support areas that identify where nature-based actions can preserve our ecological safety net while simultaneously achieving development goals. In our ELSA process, we take the principles behind systematic conservation planning, gathering data on biodiversity persistence and ecosystem intactness, and then we apply those principles to sustainable development, including water security, disaster risk reduction, food security, jobs and livelihood, and of course, climate change mitigation. 
countries can dial up or dial down different values to accurately reflect their priorities. For example, if climate change mitigation is especially important to a country, we give them the tools to adjust their ELSA map to emphasize regions with a high carbon sequestration potential. If endangered species are a priority, this process can help create maps with an added focus on protecting biodiverse ecosystems. Then we work with national experts to combine these layers to create a map for action on nature, climate, and sustainable development. In this map from Costa Rica, you can see ELSA regions where action could deliver across national commitments. Blue for areas that could be protected, green for areas that could be restored, orange for areas that could be managed, and purple for areas recommended for urban greening. For those of you who joined us back in our first se session, you might remember hearing from Enrique and Cornelia a little bit about this work in Costa Rica. The ELSA project is currently active in 12 countries who are showing us in practice how this process can impact national policy, planning, and decision making. And we operate with the support of a huge number of national collaborators shown here. So we're very excited to announce that this year, we're bringing a proof of concept of ELSA to UN Biodiversity Lab. Building on our experiences working with our 12 initial ELSA pilot countries, our goal is to develop the science to run an ELSA analysis for any country in the world. To do this, we'll use global policy priorities and global data. We'll also develop the technology to run an ELSA analysis directly on UN Biodiversity Lab. To start, with funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, we'll show how this, work, this can work for three pilot countries, Colombia, Costa Rica, and South Africa. Our goal is to scale this up to be available for any country in the world. All right, so to speak about additional new features that we'll be adding to UNBL this year, I'd like to give the final word to Lauren. Lauren, over to you. Thanks very much, Annie. Now, in addition to enabling our users to access the best of nature map, as well as UNDP's work to map essential life support areas, we're always keen to continue adding features that meet our users' needs. Our functionalities in development include enhanced data tagging and searching functions, so you can find the data you need more easily, API connectors to enable more seamless connections with our data providers, which will ensure that their most recent update is always accessible to you, and finally, we're also exploring how we can integrate new UN base maps and country boundary layers, as well as to connect to near real-time and high-resolution satellite imagery. As we look towards new funding sources, our goal is to work with, in consultation with users to develop different features, such as those you see here, from new data collections to expanded metrics, to the ability to connect to your national data repositories, as well as other features. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us to help us understand the features that could help meet your needs better and stay tuned via our newsletter for calls to join our user testing processes. Beyond the hardware of the UN Biodiversity Lab interface, we believe that it is truly the relationships that power this platform. UNBL relies on an extensive network of data providers, partners and users like you to shape our mission. Over the coming year, we will be exploring how we can bring more of you together in different venues so that you can learn from each other and make connections. We see ourselves as a convener to help ensure that these data are accessible to those who need them to take action. Building on this, we are very excited to announce a new coalition that is aiming to promote good use of spatial intelligence by countries and businesses in order to jointly achieve climate and nature objectives. This builds on the work we are sharing today on UN Biodiversity Lab, on the ELSA process, on Nature Map, and more. And in the first half of 2022, 
Space is consulting widely on the needs and interests of countries and businesses to inform and build this coalition. This inception phase is funded by the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation and is co-convened by UNEP, WCMC and Systemic. Please feel free to get in touch using the email info at spacescoalition.org and stay tuned. And with that, I will turn it back over to Amber and thank you very much for, for your attention. So thank you so much um, from our guest speakers today for their fantastic presentations and information. Um, and I wanna thank you all for being with us as well. Um, we're so glad to have the support from the full UN Biodiversity Lab Partnership, which includes our colleagues from UNEP, UNEP, WCMC, UNDP, and CBD. I also want to remind you all that um, we will have time for question and answer session, um, but if we don't get to your questions or you have follow-up questions, you can email myself. Um, or my colleagues Juan, Annie, or Dee with any um, follow-up questions. You can also find all the information about the training on the training website shown here. Um, and this includes now the homework. So if you're interested in that certificate, certificate of completion, you can um, certainly complete the homework there. And um, I also wanna mention that our site has many other trainings um, in a variety of application areas such as water resources, disasters, health and air quality, climate change. So you can check out our website if you're interested in any of these other themes as well. You can also follow us on Twitter um, to get information about upcoming trainings or, or events relevant to um, our data and trainings. I also recommend that you check out our sister programs, DEVELOP, which is our internship program and SEVERE, which is our international program. And I also wanna make note that um, after the training series is over, we will be sending you all a um, link to complete a survey. And these surveys are so important to us. Um, we really value your feedback on what you liked and what you didn't like about this training. Um, and in particular, we would love to hear about future trainings that you would like. Um, so we really do take into consideration this feedback when we create our work plans for the future and we develop trainings in different areas as well. So um, keep a lookout for a survey on the training and do um, provide your feedback as we really um, appreciate that. So thanks again, everyone. And we will now move on to the question and answer session. I want to thank you all again for, for being here. Um, we're so excited to have participants from across the world joining us for these trainings. Um, it's really great to see. Um, I also wanted to mention briefly um, again that the homework, the link to the homework is now available on the, on the RSET website. So if you are interested in that certificate of completion, you can go ahead and um, complete that homework. It includes questions from all three of the intermediate sessions. Um, so you might need to refer back to those um, to answer those. Um, so do please take a look at that. Uh, I also wanted to remind everyone that we um, will have the recordings for each of the sessions as well as the um, presentation materials and the Q&A document available on the RSET website in due time. So um, if we don't get to your question today um, or you want to just reference a question um, from the past, you can go back on the website and, and take a look at those once we've um, got those up and edited. So um, thanks again, everyone. And, and you can also see um, my email, uh, email address, uh, my colleague and my colleagues Juan and Annie's email here. Um, if there are questions that we don't get to, feel free to follow up with us as well. Um, great, and let's go ahead and jump right into the questions. We have a few for today. Um, so the first question, is it possible to upload our own polygon, which can represent districts in the UNBL to perform zonal statistics on the layers, for example, the global intactness index. And I think we'll um, jump over to Annie to answer this question. 
Great, thanks, Amber. I will jump in here on behalf of Dee. Uh, well, she's getting reconnected. We had a couple of technical difficulties. So um, you can definitely upload your places of interest to a UN Biodiversity Lab workspace, and then you can use them to calculate any of the dynamic metrics that we have available on the public platform. So we ran through those this last week, and they're also displayed on the screen. What your question is getting at I believe is performing zonal statistics for any of the layers that we have available through UN Biodiversity Lab. And this functionality is not available yet. We're limited to those eight metrics that we do have, but it's something that we are hoping to add in the future. We're also hoping to add specific metrics that speak to things like the post-2020 Global Biodiversity Framework's official indicators um, and other key indicators that countries are reporting on for their various biodiversity, climate, and sustainable development commitments. Oscar, do you have anything that you want to add into that response from your side? No, Annie, I think you've pretty much covered everything that's necessary at this stage. Awesome. Great, thank you, Annie and Oscar. So moving on to question two, um, when will the other advanced labs be available? So as Amber ran through at the beginning, our first lab was yesterday and we had a great group of participants. And our second lab will be on the 4th of May, next Wednesday, where we'll go in depth on the workspace functionalities and guide you through the exercises that Dee showed today. For those of you who weren't able to re register for these labs, we'll be making the recordings as well as all of the lab sheets available on our NASA RCIT webpage, which I think Brock is dropping into the chat. Um, and we'll also try to offer similar labs like this in the future. Um, so if you're interested in those, please sign up for our UN Biodiversity Lab mailing list, we'll drop that into the chat as well, so you can be informed about when they'll take place. Great, thank you, Annie. Yes, and the, um, the link to the homework, as well as the link to the primary RSET webpage um, is now in the chat. So um, take a look at those um, to answer your questions. Okay, question three, which projection and coordinate system do you use for the GeoJSON? So I can answer this, I think. Um, basically, we require that any GeoJSON file uploaded to UNB uh, Biodiversity Lab is in uh, WGS84 or EPSG4326 as its technical term. Um, and this is the same for whether you're uploading a place or a, a, a layer. Great, thank you, Oscar. Okay, question four. If you try to upload a spatial layer with multiple features, do you get a warning that explains why your spatial, spatial layer will not load up? Likewise, if you upload a shapefile or other, do you get a warning that it's not a GeoJSON file? Um, this is one I haven't checked off the top of my head, if I'm honest, but I would hope that you do. And if you don't, that is something we can definitely look at adding in to make sure it's clear to users. Um, but as you see here, you're still able to upload multiple files when viewing places, um, but just the attributes won't be accessible. And you can then uh, uh, um, do the zonal statistics for the whole um, group of polygons instead of per polygon. Um, Currently only GeoJSONs though are supported for places, which is uh, important to note. Um, and if you'd like to view your vector data while keeping attributes on the map, when, when you're clicking on each po polygon, the attribute table is able to pop up. We suggest that you pull the data through as a layer into your workspace. And this can be in multiple formats, depending on the cloud repository you're using. Um, and then there's a kind of a, a long kind of description of how you might go about doing that, just some specifics uh, that Dee has put in here. Great, thank you, Oscar. Yeah, there's a lot of details here. So again, um, you can reference this file once we've gone through and, and edited it and posted it on the website um, to reference that question. Great, moving on to question five. 
can different users maintain workspaces for the same locations of a country? So I think I'll answer this. I think I am understanding the question correctly, but essentially users are not limited by the actions of other users. So if the user uploads a place to their own workspace, it doesn't matter if another user has already uploaded that exact same place. Um, it'll be considered completely separately from places, uh, other, other users' places, and it's specific for your use and management within your workspace. Great, thank you, Oscar. Okay, question six. Is there a way to get locations like cities on a map without uploading the data? That is, after I zoom into a place, a country, how can I see the major cities on my map? So on the current base map, you can actually zoom into the uh, to map and um, see uh, the location of cities. Um, that, that's kind of different at various zoom levels, uh, as you will notice. Uh, but at present, we do not offer cities as places, meaning you cannot click on them and automatically calculate dynamic metrics. Um, we also don't offer, we don't have a uh, specific cities layer either on there, but we do offer, um, as you will see, uh, national and subnational admin administrative units, which you can then use, for example, to calculate the dynamic metrics. Um, and if it's something that you would need to upload, uh, basically the cities layer, if you were interested in looking in more detail, is something you would need to upload as part of your own workspace. Or alternatively, you could suggest it as a layer to be included on the public UN Biodiversity Lab space. Great, thank you, Oscar. And we have a link to submit the um, new suggestions um, via a form as well. I think we might also be putting that into the chat. Yes, thank you, Brock. Okay, question seven. Is there a document that explains how to write a configure file? And an additional question, is there a set of training files that can be used in one's UNBL workspaces? And I think we might have Dee back, so um, Oscar or Dee, feel free to take this one. And hi, yes, the configs, uh, we have examples on how to write configs on the workspace guidance, uh, and we have put the links to um, five languages there. And we currently uh, do not have a set of training files for the UNBR workspace, uh, but you can email me and uh, I can send the test files to you bilaterally, or if you registered to our advanced lab last week, uh, next week, uh, we will uh, use some training files uh, to help get you through a few hand-on exercises. Great, thank you so much, Dee. And, and we've included Dee's email there as well, um, if you have other questions. Question eight. Are there plans to allow ARC Esri users to upload their rasters? I can jump in here, Dee, if you like. Um, yes, essentially this is something that we're in the process of implementing, um, and we're also hoping to be able to uh, link to Esri Web Services very soon. We currently support links to existing uh, raster and vector layers that are already stored in Google Earth Engine, Carto, the planetary computer, and set of several other cloud locations. And you can upload your own data layers directly into UNBL's GIS data repository on Azure and have them available in your UN Biodiversity Lab workspace. Thank you, Oscar. Question nine, do viewers, editors, and admin need to have a workspace to be in the other, in the owner's workspace, or do they just need to be registered? Uh, they don't need their own workspace. We offer these different types of rules so um, members can work together using a shared workspace. Uh, I also demonstrated how to manage users and add new members to the same workspace. So uh, you can also reference the guidance um, there to see how to do that. Great, thank you, Dee. Okay, question 10. I tried to upload a GeoJSON file of my country, but apparently the file size is too big. Is there a way around this? 
Firstly, it sounds like there is a notification on file size, but we do currently have limitations, as Dee pointed out, on the upload size um, of uh, places. Um, but as we mentioned here, it'd be great to kind of work this through with the person asking the question and see if we can reach out and help them explore this further. In the meantime, it might be helpful for that person to actually use the uh, national boundaries that we have within you and biodiversity lab to you to explore their kind of country and calculate dy dy dynamic metrics based on the national boundaries that we already host within you and biodiversity lab. Okay, great. Thank you, Oscar. Okay, question 11. Regarding the UNBL layers, where does the word slug come from? I'll answer this one if you like. Um, so the term slug is not uh, unique or specific to UN Biodiversity Lab. It's actually a standard technical terminology. Um, and basically it's like a unique identifier that is human readable. Um, I'm not gonna go into too much specifics, but that's a very broad um, kind of way of describing it. Great, thank you, Oscar. Okay, um, we're getting down to um, the end of our questions here. So again, if you do have questions, please add them, um, type them in um, to the, the questions and we can transfer them over here to answer them. Um, we have, looks like we have one more question. Um, how does UNBL deal with rasters that have different cell size, different resolutions? Or do we need to control all rasters with the same resolution? We do not have limits on the resolution of rasters. Actually, on the public platform, we have various uh, resolutions of rasters from 10 meters to 10 kilometers. Um, as long as your file is in the correct format, um, you can upload to your workspace. I think the only limit uh, we have on raster is um, it's it, it, the file size uh, would be great if it's uh, under one gigabyte and uh, within uh, it, it, and it's less than 20 billion number of pixels. Beyond that, um, it will be very easy to handle the various re resolution you're uploading. Great, thank you, Dee. Um, yeah, and we're adding a few of those details here to the question as well. Um, it looks like we um, got one more question here for now. Question 13, is there a plan to allow files like GeoPackage files to upload their rasters in terms of making UNBL accessible to people from all, of the, all over the world? This seems important. Um, I can answer here, um, and Dee, if, you, if I, make any, any mistakes, just jump in, uh, that's okay. But um, I completely agree with this uh, question, you know, offering these sort of open source um, uh, standards are gonna be uh, very important moving forward. Um, we have been highlighting the uh, the ESRI solutions that we are um, looking to offer because of the magnitude of people using ESRI as an environment. Um, but yeah, we are always looking for opportunities to improve and one of them will be looking at different um, uh, uh, file types that we can allow people to work with. Great, thank you, Oscar. Um, it looks like question 14 is uh, maybe a follow on to a previous question about uh, resolutions. So the question is, can various spatial analysis be accomplished using rasters of different resolutions, or is it just allowing viewing? Um, if you are talking about uh, uploading your own raster file to your workspace, um, currently, yes, uh, we offer viewing on the Matthew, uh, where you can also share with your group members within the same workspace. There will be a more customizable function like creating your own widgets and dashboards in the workspace available uh, in the future. And at this point, um, you can only calculate the dynamic metrics we offer on the public platform. 
Thank you, Dee. Um, also note that um, Brock just put the training web page back into the chat again. And um, just a reminder that um, give us about a day to uh, get the recording of the training up. Um, but that will be available for you to come back and view uh, potentially as you might be working through the workspaces yourself or wanting to go back to um, look at the details of, of any of the things we've covered um, during the session. Okay, looks like we've got one more question here. Is there a method to track progress in biodiversity through data? Or is it limited to just analysis of the existing biodiversity scenario? If I I'm understanding, sorry, go for it. Uh, sorry, I was just saying if I'm understanding correctly, uh, I think you might be referring the time series data we uh, we, we have, and uh, we are also updating um, them when the new uh, new data comes. So, for example, we have um, forest. We have data for you to track the forest loss happened each year, um, and also we, we update uh, the enhanced vegetation index and monthly fire, also at a uh, yearly basis. That time series information will help you to track the changes status and changes on uh, biodiversity related indicators and Oscar please add your comments as well thank you that's great Dee. and the only thing I, I would add in here is that we also do have some data sets that are projecting scenarios into the future so for example we have the crop suitability data set which looks at um, the, the how likely areas of the world are going to be for um, maintaining crop crops Okay, it looks like we do have one more question here. Uh, question 16, how can we do multi-criteria site suitability kind of spatial analysis on the fly with different raster spatial resolutions? The answer is that um, at the moment, as mentioned before in previous answers, we're pretty limited to the um, uh, the current um, dynamic metrics that we offer. Um, we are, as uh, as said, looking into being able to offer the uh, a wider um, variety of dynamic metrics, but also the ability for users to develop their own um, widgets in the future. So basically all I'm saying is watch this space and then you might be able to create your own widgets to start answering that question. Yes, and uh, I also want to add that um, you can download a uh, clip and download the raster data within your places of interest on UNBL um, and do the spatial analysis on your uh, GIS device. That could be an option to um, do the kind of spatial analysis you may need. Great, thank you, Oscar and Dee. All right, so it looks like we don't have any other questions at the moment. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and end a few minutes early today. Um, I want to thank you all again for being with us. Um, it's been so great to see you all uh, over the course of these um, three intermediate sessions. Um, I want to thank um, my colleagues um, with the UNBL team for being here, answering questions, providing the really fantastic presentations. Um, a few reminders. Um, if we didn't get to, if you think of a question that you didn't answer um, here today, you can always email myself or my colleagues. Um, our email, email addresses are listed here on the, the Q&A document. Um, give us a few days to review the Q&A documents and get them um, uploaded to the course website. We will also have the recording available for all of the sessions as well as the presentation materials on um, the course website. 
And, and finally, if you are interested in that um, certificate of completion, the homework link is now available. You can um, complete the homework via Google Forms. And if you've attended the rest of the sessions, we will have cataloged your attendance and we'll be sending out um, certificates in about two months. Give us a little time to work through those. Um, and then for those of you who might be registered and um, attending next week, we look forward to seeing you for the, the final advanced lab. For those of you who were not able to register for that, we will be providing those materials on the website after the completion of the course as well. Um, so we, we really do hope that you enjoyed the webinar series. Um, Brock has also um, put in um, uh, some information about our uh, surveys. And you will be receiving an email um, with a link to a survey. And I want to mention that those are so, so valuable to us. So please let us know what you liked, what you didn't like um, about this training in particular, and also what you'd like to see in the future. We really use the surveys to provide us feedback and um, suggestions for future RSET trainings. Um, so we do really take those into consideration um, if you uh, choose to complete the, the um, email. So you'll receive an email from Alchemer shortly for that. So thanks again, everyone. Great to see you on. Have a nice morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. And we hope to um, see you all again soon. Thank you.